Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim O'Connor. I am the Impact Manager at Amnesty International here in Australia. I am delighted to uh, welcome you today to this uh, important webinar where we have a distinguished list of guests um, all the way from Jayapur uh, to Jakarta, uh, also to here in Australia. And their geographic diversity also recognise their incredible um, commitment and uh, the diversity of, of skills and experiences uh, in working on the issues of human rights uh, and in the um, engagement with uh, often complicated matters that occur between Australia and Indonesia in, uh, in this area. Um, before we officially commence, I will hand over to my colleague, Danielle Veldre, who will explain to you how the translation will work today and how you can uh, get on board. Thanks, Dan. Hi, welcome everyone. Thanks, Tim. Um, so just a couple of quick housekeeping notes for everyone. Um, if you would like the English to Bahasa Indonesian uh, translation, you can access that by um, looking at the interpretation button, which looks like a globe on the bottom of your screen. Um, and then you can choose from that um, which uh, language you would like. Um, if you would like the sign language interpretation, which is Bahasa Indonesian, you will see one of our um, amazing sign language interpreters uh, signing right now for you. Um, you can also have a live transcript um, available to you if you would like to see that on the screen. Um, and um, just letting you know that this webinar is being recorded um, and we're also hoping to live stream it on YouTube as well. So just be mindful of that um, uh, when asking questions and so forth. Um, and I am going to hand back to Tim. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Danielle. Um, so yeah, just to acknowledge, uh, I am joining you today from the Gadigal Wonga lands, the Eora people. Uh, the Aura Nation, sorry, uh, and we acknowledge elders past and present and all the Indigenous people here today and uh, First Nations people right across uh, the globe. Um, so before we, we, we haven't got a lot of time today and we've got a lot of expertise um, to share, we do want to encourage your questions. Um, they will be moderated, um, but if you see down the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will see a QA and a button. If you do have questions of any of the panellists today as we go along, uh, please do include your um, questions in there. They will go to uh, the moderators who will then share them back with us. And um, without further ado, uh, we, we shall commence. And I am um, delighted to firstly introduce you to, and I'll introduce each of the panelists as we come to them, uh, Rosa Mowind. Rosa is a West Papuan human rights activist currently living in uh, West Papua. She believes in the nonviolence movement uh, as a way to make change with the power of the people. Rosa is a co-founder of Make West Papua Safe campaign, uh, which is based in Australia. And uh, we can share the link with you uh, for that important campaign um, in the chat as we go on. So Rosa, as I was um, discussing with you last week, uh, the situation in um, Jayapura and, and the broader Papua regions has been a complicated one, particularly by COVID and uh, the imminence of the, the pond national sports games, uh, which are about to happen. Can you give us a bit of an insight into how COVID is impacting uh, the people of Papua today? Um, yes, thank you, Tim, um, for a good introduction. But also, um, before I speak, I just want to acknowledge uh, the people of Tabati and their land where I now sit down and speaking to all of you. Uh, yes, of course, COVID-19 has become uh, one of the key issue and also challenge for everyone around the world, but in particular for the West Papuan here, because um, we had quite a big number of cases uh, recently and just uh, slowing down uh, this uh, last two months. Um, and of course, uh, for us, we try to uh, deal with the COVID-19 pandemic and with the national uh, programs of vaccination is one of the key uh, or big issue at the moment because uh, uh, in one side, people want to stop pandemic and make more uh, uh, immune and create um, community immune system. But at the same time, government uh, 
uh, response to the COVID-19 pandemic is also create another issue for the West Papuan. Uh, for us, uh, many of us, uh, the, the response to the COVID is more about healthcare matter and systems, and it should be done in a way or in a proper way that uh, many of uh, West Papuan people could get access and also um, get the protection. But at the same time, many people still traumatized because of the, the issue that uh, come out later where uh, vaccination done by the military and police member that for us, many of us, it create traumatized and, and especially uh, with the recent development that um, the, the, the government uh, used uh, military and um, uh, police or officers, uh, military officers, and even from the National Intelligence Bureau to run the vaccination across West Papua. And that's quite worrying for us because of the, uh, the political background of West Papua, of course, and people uh, for us, it's a big question why it should be done by military and uh, intelligent uh, bureau, uh, national uh, being or uh, national uh, intelligence bureau, because it should be done by the health department, and maybe they can organize volunteers if they uh, they have lack of numbers of uh, people to do the vaccination. But that's a big question, and we have some reports from the. Uh, from the place like in Wamena, in Kurulu, for example, the military from the uh, Air Force, they uh, did the vaccination in Kurulu, in Wamena. So they went to the uh, villages in, uh, and they went to the Silimo uh, and brought people together in, in, the, in front of their Silimo, Honais, and then started to vaccinate people without uh, a proper process of that. So it's quite worrying because then uh, uh, based on our report from the context uh, in Wamena, they said that there there was no um, a proper uh, health screening. So you just go there and you know give them food and then get get them to vaccinated. So I think it's that this kind of process is actually a bit worrying for West Papuan and especially leading to the uh, national sport game or Pekan Olahraga Nasional that will be uh, uh, will be host uh, very soon uh, the the government's trying to target more fa uh, more vaccine for the people but in a way they uh, create the awareness is not to make people aware of the the importance of the vaccine for their health but it's more on the uh, how to get uh, the national sport games happening without people get COVID. Just so they they promoting the message and the narrative they develop on the public uh, awareness is about, okay, let's get vaccines so you can watch the games. So I think this is, this is like, a, um, commodific, com, you know, make the vaccination is not as a part of the health care and build a health, a strong health uh, immunity, but uh, rather create a more uh, message on, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, how to create more uh, benefit in terms of economy and also uh, how to make the national program uh, happened in, in West Papua. And also related to PON, uh, Pekan Olaraga National still is the dropping of more uh, brigade mobile police from other provinces to Jayapura and, and other city like Timika and Merauke uh, as the uh, host of the uh, games, uh, just to do the security and protection for the athletes. But uh, for many of us, it's not necessary because police is already well, we already have many police and brigade mobile police in Jayapura and uh, in other cities. So uh, it is so obvious that uh, with the the presence of more police, uh, military uh, police and brimob in in those cities, it create tension that people thought this is not a games, but this is more on the security project. So yeah, so that's a, a little bit um, kind of a situation at the moment and. Uh, you can also find in the news and media that mention that uh, some athletes uh, will be uh, provided with the security from their own uh, police, uh, from their own province. Yeah, th thank you so much, Rosa. I mean, the, the complexities of COVID 
um, creates uh, uh, um, an additional complexity, I guess, to the the um, the challenges that are faced in uh, West Papua in, re in regard to human rights and, and Papua more generally. Um, can can you give us an insight into the 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 background to that human rights situation, particularly what you're trying to achieve through the the uh, Make West Papua Safe uh, campaign? As we can see, someone's um, I think um, Margaret has popped the the link in there to the to the Make West Papua Safe org website for people who want. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, so Make West Papua Safe is a campaign uh, focusing on, um, we try to looking at the, uh, how the, uh, the foreign uh, government funding to support uh, police training and military training in Indonesia that impact to the West Papuan uh, human rights situation. Uh, because we know that the increase of the um, military and police uh, oppression and violence against the civilian, especially uh, against the uh, human rights activists or freedoms activists. Uh, even uh, when they, they try to uh, raise the awareness and the issue of human rights violations in West Papua, uh, and always they have to face uh, violence against uh, uh, with the police and uh, military and the increase of the uh, military and police joint operation in the highlands uh, like in uh, Duga, in Tanjaya, uh, Punchak uh, and recently in Tambrau, Maibrat and in uh, and Kiwirok I think it's it's very uh, obvious that we need to do something and most of the our findings from our campaign is that we found there is a link a strong link between the support of the uh, foreign funding, especially from Australia and also some other countries like Germany, uh, UK, uh, even South Korea uh, to support uh, police and military trainings, uh, especially through the trainings of the police in Jack Lake Samarang um, that uh, provide technology, skills and knowledge for the officers to to get more better as a police officer and and we knew and we found some of the uh, names that have high position on the uh, military instit uh, police institution in Indonesia which is actually uh, people who are directly have a connection with the uh, with the orders and commands to this to some of the incidents uh, happened in West Papua and I think uh, they've been trained by this institution and they are supported by uh, funding from uh, from other countries especially with uh, in our campaign is uh, from Australia and uh, Australian Federal Police is actually supporting uh, knowledge skills and and even send the trainer and persons to uh, to train these uh, police members. So I think this is very important for us if we want to stop human rights violations in West Papua and Indonesia. I think uh, as a people of Australia, I think we uh, you also need to uh, to see how your tax money goes or where your tax money goes. Is that going to the to the right purpose or it going to the to the way that it creates violence and more human rights abuses to the civilians in other countries. I think that's the point. So our campaign is more focusing on that and trying to uh, to change, uh, to influence the policy of the Australian government to think about how they, they should uh, uh, work together or relate with the Indonesia uh, as a state because uh, it's, it's not only about the defense and security, but we also have to look at the humanity and how that uh, relationship uh, influencing uh, the situation of human rights and situation of people, uh, especially in West Papua. So that's, that's our campaign basically based. So you can visit our Facebook page and, and you know, just uh, be part of that. And sometimes we also do some actions and uh, some discussions. So yes, yeah. And of course, with the Amnesty, we, we started to uh, a bit more closely work together to look at the impact of that on the human rights situation in West Papua. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. No, thanks so much, Rosa. I mean, I think it's very important to make those links back to the countries that are that are funding and engaged directly with uh, the Indonesian military, Brimov, etc. Um, but uh, one person that we've brought many to many people here today, um, I see people from um, New Zealand and across Indonesia and Australia are joining us, um, has been Victor Yamo. So Victor was arbitrarily arrested and charged with treason um, for peacefully protesting. Can you give us a, a short update on Victor? 
Yes, uh, Victor, uh, as you all know, probably from the media that he's uh, he's been uh, arrested and he was put under the isolation cell at the brim of detention. But um, because of his uh, health condition, very poor health condition, so he had to be, um, uh, is, he was very sick. So finally, um, human rights defenders, lawyers and uh, activists, people, uh, managed to get him to the hospital and now he's under the medical treatment uh, and he got um, quite serious uh, illness especially something related to his uh, lung he has TB and it's uh, on the level of uh, the resistance uh, drugs TB so it means that he needs more longer treatment and at the moment he's um, is on the treatment but uh, we know that it will take quite long time for the treatment and it will influence the legal process uh, of his case uh, so the lawyers now is trying to get him to uh, get more um, uh, time for the treatment especially uh, because it seems like um, uh, he'll be uh, he'll be took back to the detention in Brimop, so we don't want him to get back there because the, of the poor condition. So what we want is to keep him uh, in a medical treatment and uh, either it's in hospital or at the house detention because it's uh, if he has to go back to the uh, correction institution and that we know that condition is very poor and it's not good for his health condition. So for, for us now is how to get him uh, to get more better condition and um, he has to take the medicine regularly so we need uh, we need to work hard on how to get them uh, something come from the court that he, he can stay as a as a uh, in a house detention so at the moment uh, that's only update that I can give uh, nothing really make the progress but in terms of the process we need more support from the public to make sure that he will get a proper uh, medical treatment uh, either it's uh, for six months or even more than six months so um, he's also very committed to the legal process he 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 said that uh, the most important thing right now is his health condition first yeah thank you so much rosa for that for that uh, update on on victor's situation uh we'll now come to um veronica komen as many of you will know, um, Veronica is a, a human rights activist and lawyer um, um, and is renowned for her courageous work in exposing human rights violations in the Indonesian provinces of Papua and West Papua, uh, which is collectively referred to as West Papua. But um, uh, for that work, um, Veronica has also um, dedicated the Ronald Wilson Human Rights Award uh, in Australia. So recognised internationally for your work. And thanks so much for joining us today. Veronica, I know you, just on the situation of, of Victor, I know you've been involved in um, establishing a, a campaign, a crowdfunded campaign. We might pop the link in there for people who did want to support it and provide some of that assistance. But um, Veronica, many Australians um, will be unaware there's a brutal and sustained um, conflict occurring in parts of Papua. Can you give us some insights into the roots of this conflict and, and how exactly that is playing out today? Thank you, Tim. Uh, hello everyone. So um, yeah, I will be speaking mainly um, in in answering to that question. I'll be speaking mainly in two big points. The first one about armed conflict, and second is displacement because they are interlinked. So the um, uh, uh, the uh, West Papua is at its worst since Suharto era. The armed conflict has never before this large it is now uh, the armed conflict is um uh it's it's so uh it's so bad that uh international humanitarian law is uh is now uh, applied in in the in the situation in west papua so uh it's the uh, the armed conflict is uh currently at least in uh, sorry currently in uh nine regencies and it's spreading to outside Central Highlands because it used to be uh, in the Central Highlands where the stronghold of the Liberation Army is. It's now spreading outside Central Highlands. And um, there's also, uh, we, we have to question that um, why Indonesia keeps insisting to use military approach while it is uh, already proven fail, like, like right now. 
the military operations in West Papua is uh, like like I said earlier that it, it's worst since uh, uh, Suharto era. But why the National Liberation Army has never before this strong and this big? They are getting stronger. They are they are getting larger. So it's it's very uh, ironic, right? It's uh, when Jakarta is is trying that they're 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 uh, you know uh, deploying. Uh, so many military, but instead of crushing the Liberation Army, the Liberation Army is stronger than uh, never uh, before. I mean, the, the strongest ever. So uh, uh, from my um, uh, interviews with the, uh, the, the, the people on the ground, uh, why there are many uh, the Liberation Army getting, getting stronger, I can at least identify three factors why there are many uh, new soldiers and they are mostly young people. Uh, the first one is because uh, this, mili this new military operations by Indonesia create more hatred. So uh, uh, this is cycle of violence. Uh, and so that's why more, especially young people joining the Liberation Army. Uh, second one is because there are so many tens of thousands of international internally displaced persons right now, IDPs, and and these uh, IDPs, uh, uh, many of them are also joining the the Deliberation Army because they are unassisted. I will go to that later. The third uh, factor is that uh, many of these uh, uh, many of the the, the, the IDPs are. Uh, uh, often uh, subjected to uh, interrogation by uh, Indonesian forces and being uh, being uh, 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 that, uh, that they are Indonesian forces suspicious of them uh, accusing them of freedom fighters. So they they feel like they are, they, they are safer in the forest. So they join the, the, the Liberation Army. Uh, they feel safer that way. Uh, and then uh, uh, that is uh, at least what I can identify and. And what is more important, why uh, 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 it's it's so tragic that this armed conflict situation is being so overlooked, is that because there are many hundreds of child soldiers in West Papua. But I would like to ask you to please not put your um, uh, uh, Western uh, uh, IHL perspective, uh, international humanitarian law perspective, because we are talking about indigenous community who already have their own set of law of war, even before the IHL was even discussed in the, in the West. So uh, I, I interviewed uh, uh, the, uh, the child soldiers and, and the, uh, the, just the, the people on the ground uh, in, in three regencies. And this is consistent to my interview as well with uh, Yogor Talengen. Yogor is a, uh, a freedom fighter who is now sentenced to life in prison. He was the, the only West Papuan ever to be uh, prosecutor sought uh, uh, death sentence to him. So uh, the, the, why there are child soldiers in West Papua, uh, I can also identify at least three reasons. The first one is that because in their villages, there's no school. So they grew up as child children with no school in their village. So all they know is that, and, and they are, they are also, uh, they, they were born in war zone. And uh, they, they, they see with the witness in their own eyes uh, that uh, become their family become the uh, uh, victims of Indonesian military operations of uh, brutality. And also that because they, they, they just, because there's no school, they just follow their, their, their family gardening and also uh, uh, because it's uh, members of Lib Liberation Army and like, like Yogurt Tanglengen, uh, for example, he already started to yield uh, a wooden weapon since he was 10 years old, because that's all, uh, that's all they know. And, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, so this is why it's, it's so worrying. Uh, and uh, another point uh, is that the, uh, the significance of National uh, Liberation Army. Um, I, I'd like to put an, an instance of an incident just last week uh, in, in Kiwirok, in the, uh, the Star Mountains, where uh, uh, health workers were attacked by the, the National Liberation Army. There needs to be uh, a further investigation because this case is very complex. And, uh, but basically, uh, this needs uh, to be a, a uh, investigation to to prevent further civilian uh, attacks against civilians because it's so important to identify whether this is a one-off incident or that there's a shift that 
that the violence in West Papua is so bad right now that there's a shift in the uh, how um, uh, West Papuan see towards uh, uh, the non Papuan civilians in West Papua. Uh, uh, what I was trying to say is that because health workers and teachers are known to be very respected in West Papua. If there's a traditional uh, cooking event, for example, that these people, teachers and health workers are always given the best food, they get the, the, the first best food, but why they are attacked? This is because partly I think that um, uh, uh, the, the, the National Liberation Army is uh, has uh, a huge role in this, that, um, this is also a, a, a factor why, uh, how we can see that the nation, West Papua National Liberation Army is a national liberation army, not a terrorist group, because they are gaining, they have the popular support of the people they are defending. Uh, that's important under IHL. And because the National Liberation Army say that we are, uh, those are not doctors, those are not teachers, they were uh, 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 military officers in disguise. So this can create uh, a uh, um, like suspicion, further suspicion of, uh, among the uh, larger non papuan civilians, uh, especially in, in doctors and uh, the, the I mean health workers and and teachers. Like uh, since the Liberation Army said that there are many posters circling around that uh, uh, showing that the uh, Indonesian army members also wear uh, like like the doctor's outfit. And so it, this can lead to, 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 to further uh, uh, violence and it's very worrying. And my uh, last point about armed conflict is that this also leads to uh, uh, intermittent uh, internet and mobile shutdown in the uh, where, where, where an incident of uh, armed conflict happens and also mass arrest and mostly uh, uh, arbitrary arrest towards civilians. And about displacement, this is not so uh, too long, um, that there are currently at least 50,000 um, displaced people, and among them, at least 400 have died. It's so unfortunate where international community just turned blind eye to this just because they, they, they didn't die at, at an instant, at an instant in uh, like, like one time. They, they, they died throughout two years, so that's why as if like no one cares. And uh, they are mostly unassisted because mainly uh, two reasons. The first one that Jakarta uh, refused to acknowledge them. We can see this from uh, how the uh, uh, Indonesia's forces would shut down any protests uh, or, or even uh, a donation collection uh, uh, to, uh, for, for this cause for the displaced people. It's because uh, by acknowledging that the IDPs, it means Indonesia is acknowledging there's problem and Indonesia doesn't want that. That's why they're shutting down any information about IDPs. And second one, because there's a custom in uh, uh, among the in the uh, past pop ones that they cannot receive aid from the enemy. They're in war with Indonesia, so then they don't want receiving uh, any any help from their enemy. This goes to, 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 to my conclusion that there needs urgent international uh, assistance in West Papua. First, because that trust gap that I just uh, elaborated, that in uh, 10 years ago, the Indonesian Scientific Agency identified that, uh, for example, that the, uh, the, the lack of development uh, causes the, uh, was identified as one of the root uh, causes of the conflict. I don't think that's even relevant anymore. The trust is the distrust is so deep that it's no longer relevant. That West Papuans, many of them are saying that that they don't want any more development because it's as if like uh, Jakarta is trying to buy buy off their uh, uh, lives, and uh, also uh, like like for example like like vaccines as well. Uh, West Papuans uh, refuse vaccination because they they don't believe that Indonesia could give something good for West Papua, it's impossible. That's why it must be poison or something. And, uh, uh, and it's also important for international actors to start approaching the, 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 the National Liberation Army, because like I said, they have a, a huge role in shifting how uh, uh, civilians in West Papua are seen. Like, like uh, 
uh, it, it, there, there's a paranoia. Uh, well, this is actually common paranoia in armed conflict situation where uh, the uh, are, are they spies? Are they uh, military in disguise? Uh, that kind of situation. We are, we are, we are. I think we are already in that situation, and and we can't get it, let it worse because it could be very dangerous. And then, uh, of course, international actors to approach the Indonesian government to to uh, please uh, mediate with uh, the, the West Papuan people as uh, as an equal. Uh, Indonesia used to be able to do this with Aceh. Why not to to, to West Papua? Yeah, that's uh, from me from now. Uh, for now, I mean, thanks, Tim. Yeah, thanks so much, Veronica. Um, uh, yeah, a lot to a lot to unpack there. Absolutely, um, and um, you know that call, the impact of the the lack of trust um, compounded by a situation like COVID and the response vaccinations being conducted by the military um, certainly making things um, much more complicated in an already very complex situation. Uh, individual and mass uh, human rights abuses occurring as a result. Um, I guess we'll now come to Dr. Richard Chevelle. Um, uh, Richard is a, um, a fellow with the Melbourne University's Asia Institute. He's got a very distinguished career in fostering understanding between the people of Australia and Indonesia, has written extensively on politics and tensions across Indonesia, appears regularly in the media, and his many publications and academic achievements include assisting the establishment of the Centre of Australian Studies at the University of Indonesia. So, so Richard, we're, we're hearing a lot today about the um, you know, the challenges faced by the people of West Papua and, and um, the, the human rights abuses that are occurring there. I guess, how do you see the Indonesian government's policies uh, in relation to this area contributing to these ongoing human rights violations? Uh, thank, thanks, Tim, and thanks Amnesty International for the, um, for the invitation to participate in this important webinar. As um, some of you have looked at my writings, I'm, I, I have made great, great use of uh, Amnesty International reports uh, on human rights abuses in, uh, in Papua. So I, for that, I'm most grateful and, and grateful for the opportunity to participate in, in, in this webinar. Uh, but before making my, my remarks, I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people who are the First Nations people of where I live in Melbourne and also uh, Mel Melbourne University. I'd also like to thank uh, Veronica for her excellent outline of the, 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 the current patterns of, uh, of, of violence in, in West Papua and, and how, they are, uh, how, how they are evolving. I'd, <clears throat> I'd like to, in a sense, take a step back from that very contemporary discussion of the, of the, of the cycle of violence in West Papua to, to address the question which Tim asked me of, of how Indonesian government policies contribute uh, to the seem, seemingly ongoing pattern of, of human rights abuse. And I think, to, to my mind, I think we need to, to think about the, the, the nature of Indonesian governance. You know, I think as, as, as Amnesty and um, um, Human Rights Watch and others have uh, have, have noted in reports over the, the, the last you know, two, two decades, um, whereas human rights abuses elsewhere in Indonesia have tended to, uh, to diminish, that has not been the, uh, the, been, been, been the case in, in West Papua. And I've uh, been asked to, to address the question of why this is the, uh, is the case. And I'd yeah, ra 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 rather than think about human rights abuses as a as, as a legal issue and a moral ethical issue, I'd like to to advance the argument that we need also to think about think think about human rights abuses as a governance problem. You know, what 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 is it about Indonesian governance in in Papua and West Papua, uh, which really makes human rights abuses, military operations, as Veronica was, was outlining for us, such an integral part of, you know, such an integral and ongoing part of, of, of Indonesian governance. And I think it comes, 
comes back and we, we, we have, I think, to, to think about how governing Papua looks, looks like from Jakarta's perspectives uh, and, and interests. You know, we can you know, look back, reflect back on Indonesian administration since 1963. Uh, and there has really, you know, from that from that from that time onwards, and in in many sense going back into the Dutch, in, into the Dutch era, uh, there, there has been armed and political diplomatic Papuan resistance to in 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 Indonesian control. So I think from Jakarta's point of view, uh, it's confronted with a situation of what sort of governance. Can Indonesia try and develop in West Papua uh, when a significant portion of the population does not consent to Indonesian rule? And if, if we, you know, we, we we look back on that you know, the period since '63, and at no stage has Indonesian Indonesian control been threatened by either peaceful or armed resistance by various Papuan groups. Uh, but the means that Indonesia uh, has chosen to, to assert and maintain its control of West Papua is essentially through military means. And as yeah, Amnesty and others have, have documented, you know, the military operations very nearly inevitably lead to patterns of uh, of human rights abuses, displacement, and so on, as as Veronica was was um, uh, was, was was outlining to us. But if we, you know, then you know, what are the what are the political consequences of this this approach? Uh, and as you know, Le Leapy's research going back to the Papua roadmap, I think it cle clearly clearly detailed that yeah, military operations and human rights abuses are one of the key factors uh, that we have to understand if we want to understand why the Papuan support for independence and resistance to Indonesian administration uh, remains, uh, remains so strong. So in, 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 in a way, the Indonesian reliance on a strong military presence, and we've got to keep in mind that the deployment of of security forces, so both T and E and and, uh, and police, on a population basis, on a per capita basis, is greater in the Papuan provinces than anywhere else in the country. Uh, that 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 it, it is in a sense counterproductive. It, it's well, it's effective in terms of maintaining Indonesian control of West Papua, but ineffective and it's counterproductive. In, 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 in terms of resolving the conflict uh, or persuading many Papuans that you know, their future, you know, they should be looking for a future in Indonesia. And that in that sense, it's been, uh, it's been I think, quite, uh, quite, quite counterproductive. But I think that I, I was struck by a, a reported comment in the press from the, the, the then defense minister, uh, retired General Ramisa uh, at a, at, in, in September uh, 2019, so du during the widespread uh, anti-racist demonstrations in, in, both, uh, in both provinces. And in, in response to appeals through, I think, Governor Nembe and other, other elected officials, church leaders in Papua, that police and, and military should be withdrawn from Papua. Uh, in order to, you know, to to establish a more peaceful, uh, a more, more peaceful environment, and Ramisad said, and I quote him, uh, "I have repeatedly stated that the T&E and National Police will not be withdrawn from Papua because once they are pulled out, Papua will secede." And I'm not sure whether this was a sort of off the cuff, not not particularly considered comment. By Ramisad, but I, I think it nevertheless acknowledges, perhaps more explicitly than some of the comments, some of the not dissimilar comments from the security coordinating security minister Mafud in in in, in recent months, uh, 
acknowledging the dependence of the national government on military deployments and the military operations uh, to sustain its um, uh, it, its control uh, over the two the the the, the, the two Papuan uh, provinces. And this, as I'm sure many of you have you know, follow follow the statements that the official rhetoric coming out of Jakarta that we know we no longer have Indonesian no, no longer has a, a security approach as was the case uh, under Sukarno and, and, and Suharto we now have a, a peaceful um, cultural approach a welfare approach uh, but the you know the deployment of, 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 of troops, the military operations, the displacements, all speak to an entirely different situation. So that the, you know, Jakarta is doing one thing with one hand and, and, and um, proclaiming it's doing an entirely no, uh, another thing um, uh, publicly. And uh, you know, this clear, clearly is not, um, not, not particularly, uh, particularly credible at the, at the moment. So that the, uh, I think we're looking at a, you know, we, we reflect back on, uh, reflect back on the Jakarta government policies uh, since the, uh, the, the, the fall of Sahata. I think there's sort of vacillated between a, a brief period of reasonable accommodation and, and, and negotiations under Abdul, President Abdul Rahman Wahid. Um, but Wahid is, is, much revered and, and, and respected you know, both then, you know, when he was president and, and, and subsequently by, by, by many Papuans. But I think where Gustur failed, Abu Rahman failed, was to convince many other members of the national political elite in Jakarta to follow uh, his accommodative, uh, accommodative approach. And if we look at Look at all the other presidents from Megawati through to um, uh, President Jokowi. None of them have seen uh, seen Gustur's accommodative negotiating approach um, to issues in Papua as a, as a model for, for 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 government policy. And in fact, the 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 you know while there has been some variation from Mega through to do, through through to Jokowi. Uh, that they have essentially been been based on Jakarta using its security forces uh, to restrict and contain political expression and political organisation. Uh, so, so that um, you know, I, I, I think the that brief period of Abdul Rahman Wahid's um, presidency, I think, showed many people in Jakarta, and I'm talk, talking about the, the military and political elite in, 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 in Jakarta, the risks from their, from their point of view, from their interests, of having, a, of, of, of having a, a relaxed, more open political environment, uh, and what I think they learned, and the, the, the conclusions they drew from that, uh, from that period of, of time, was the pro-independent sentiment could be very quickly and effectively mobilized um, if Jakarta didn't explicitly try to contain uh, and and, um, uh, and and suppress those pro independence uh, pro independence elements. So I think that that that, that is I, know, I think that, that that goes back to the 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 issue of the nature of uh, the the nature of Indonesian governance, and I think it's important to. To, to see the dilemma from the policy makers' perspectives and interest in, uh, in, in, in Jakarta. And they can you know, reflect back on the, the so-called Papuan Spring and see the risks to Jakarta's interests in that more uh, relaxed attitude to, uh, uh, to, 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 to political control. Um, and, and I think it's that you know, as Rami said, and the quote from Rami said, suggests it is um, not always publicly recognised, but occasionally publicly recognised that, that um, Jakarta is dependent on a very significant deployment of, of, of security forces to maintain its control.
which, as I've argued, is, is in a sense in somewhat long, 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 longer term, and as Veronica was arguing, um, counterproductive in in the sense that it, that it, it encourages and supports many Papuans uh, to oppose, you know, to support independence and oppose continuing uh, in Indonesian uh, Indonesian control. And I, I think it's important to, to think of it as a as a governance problem. I think some of, some of the um, Amnesty International reports have noted in the in the illegal killings and and other um, human human rights abuses that many of these have occurred in interactions with with Papuans, which have not been explicitly pro independence or. or uh, pro protests against uh, against Indonesian uh, Indonesian rule, which suggests to me that it it is part you know that 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 violence is part of how the security forces interact with sections of Papuan society. You know, quite in a sense, quite separate uh, from um, from from suppressing pro independence. Uh, pro-independence opinion. So you know, I think you can develop that into an argument about how violence has become part of the security forces institutional culture, which po po poses the, the problem. It's going to take more than a, an email and a WhatsApp from Jokowi to stop it. You know, you, you to, you, you're talking about generations of a, a, of a a culture of political violence and how you turn that about, I, th I think, is, is going to be um, going to be complicated. Which is, you know, I think one of the, the reasons why I've always been attracted by Budi Hanawan's analysis of of, um, uh, of torture in West Papua, and and how you know part of Budi's argument is that that human right, you know, torturing and human rights abuses. Uh, are not kept secret. You know, part of their purpose is to display that violence to a greater group of Papuans than simply the people being attacked. So you know, the, there is the, the broader intimidation uh, in, intimidation effect. But I think you know, Budi, I think, has, has drawn our attention to the way that this has become institutionalised. So, you know, to address the question of, of, um, of, of human rights abuses in terms of in Indonesian, uh, Indonesian policy, it, it, it is a, uh, going to be a complex and, and long-term uh, problem to address. Um, and, and, you know, you know if we, we look at the, the, the very... The, the very partially successful attempts by 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 Leapy and the Papuan Peace Network uh, to to encourage a dialogue uh, with with the, with the national government. Uh, this has been you know, la largely un, unsuccessful, and I'd suggest to you it's been been unsuccessful in part because of Jakarta's lack of confidence you know, to to develop a system of governance that is not significantly dependent on, on, on the security forces. So if, if, if I could briefly turn to the, the second point that I was the <clears throat> yeah, Just quickly, Richard, we're, we're, we haven't got a whole lot of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry, mate. Uh, right. Yeah, um, the, the, the issue of Papua and the bilateral relations, uh, bilateral relations between Australia and Indonesia and the, the role of human rights uh, in, in, in that, I, I think you know, re re reflecting back, you know, Papua has been an issue in the bilateral relationship really since 1950. And I, I think many of us are probably too young uh, to, 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 rem uh, to remember that from 1950 through to 1962, the then Menzies government in Australia um, supported the continuation of the Dutch administration uh, in Papua, so in other, in other words, opposed Indonesia's, so Kano's claim that Papua was part of Indonesia and, uh, and, and for a brief period when, when uh, 
cooperation agreement with the colonial Australian colonial administration in Papua was in force, supported in principle the idea of self-determination for both sides of the uh, of, of the um, uh, of the of the island. So that um, and yeah, you know, the Menzies government was most reluctant in 1962 to to accept the the uh, the uh, the New York Agreement and then the uh, the act of free choice and we can you know we can we can run through the the various you know, crisis points of the you know um, 2006 uh, refu ref refugees and and then the um, short term suspension of military uh, of, of, of military training you know all all, all the uh, and the, the uh, the resolution, resolution in inverted commas of the um, of, of the asylum seekers in in the in in the um, in the Lombok Treaty, uh, we're all aware of the of, of how Papua continues to be um, an, an issue in the in in the in the bilateral relationship, and I think it was notable in in Dutton and Payne's recent visit to Jakarta. Uh, you know, in, in a sense, the language of that was really in the in, within the framework of the uh, of the security agreement, security partnership, and there was virtually none of the language that we can look back at the um, the Lombok Treaty. You know, there was no discussion about the the activities of pro pro independence activists in. Um, in, in Australia, uh, the, 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 the only uh, interesting aspect of in, in Minister Payne's press conference and, and media release was several times mentioning of developing trilateral uh, cooperation, Jakarta, Canberra and the Pacific. And, and given given that the Pacific Pacific Islands are the focus of much of the UNWP and Papua international lobbying on independence and human rights issues, I think that was one of the most significant points that came out of Dutton and Payne's um, uh, recent visit to Jakarta. So I think I've probably gone over my time limit. So apologies for that. No, thanks, Richard. I mean, it, it's fascinating. Um, Fascinating theories that you that you bring there. I guess, I guess I'll come now to um, Usman Hamid, uh, and many of you know Usman is the director of Amnesty International in Indonesia. Uh, he's got a lifelong commitment to human rights in his home country. He's uh, been coordinator of Contrast, um, involved in presidential fact finding team that investigated the murder of Munir. Um, he studied that uh, in the in Australia and also in the in the US and the UK. Um, and uh, Usman, I guess on, on that theme, um, um, Richard was touching on, you know, the human rights abuses being a kind of a product of governance. I'm in, interested in your in your views on that. Um, but what, what what do you see? Is that um, the one of the key barriers to delivering human rights to the people of um, Papua provinces? Well, thanks, Tim. I think uh, the key barriers, among others, uh, for Papuan people to ensure human rights and justice is, you know, um, stigmatizations and the labeling politics, as well as the weak rule of law. But before I elaborate these points, let me firstly welcome uh, the public statement made yesterday by the UN Special Reporter on the Situations of Human Rights Defenders, Ms. Uh, Mary Lawler. So she said that, you know, the life of Victor Yemo, uh, a jailed West Papuan activist in danger without urgent medical care. And the UN call on Indonesia, Indonesian authorities to provide, uh, to provide him with proper medical care to keep him from dying in prison. Nevertheless, you know, despite repeated requests from lawyers, from human rights organization in Indonesia for a delay on medical grounds for Yemo, 
he went on trial in in a Jakarta in a Jaya, Jayapura court at the end of August uh, last month on charges of of treason and incitement related to his peaceful involvement in anti-racism and self-determination protests in 2019. So the case of Yemo is just an example of how Papuan people is or are facing uh, barriers in ensuring human rights and, and justice for Papuan and in Papua. And I do hope that the Indonesian government take into account of this call from the UN experts, such as from the uh, uh, UN special reporter on the situation of human rights defenders. So let me get back to my two points. Uh, number one, one of the most key barriers is stigmatizations and the labeling politics. So in Papua, uh, any type of human rights and social justice activity is invariably tainted with the label separatist and thus uh, justifying a repressive uh, response by the security forces and law enforcement agencies. And this transports across difficult and remote terrain that is often controlled by the companies that operate there. And moreover, this has also you know, significant implications to the security and protection of the Papuan people, such as Yemo and others, who wants to, to fight for human rights and, and justice. And in recent years, uh, the situation is even more complex, you know, uh, added to the already difficult and dangerous conditions, the potential for horizontal conflict in such diverse and deprived communities are exacer exacerbated and provoked by external parties that have an interest in conflict and be it to discredit the communities or to argue in favor of military deployment and armed responses. So in short, the state's security approach against uh, peaceful activists such as Victor Yemo or other pro-independence uh, armed groups uh, coupled with uh, labelization or stigmatization and negative perception among uh, security forces that label Papuan uh, as separatists have resulted in, in a more and more human rights violations. And, and this approach has done little to end pervasive uh, culture of impunity in, in the region. Uh, the second point uh, of, of the key barriers, which I mentioned uh, in the beginning, is the weak rule of law. The people of, of Papua have never seen justice. Justice has never been delivered uh, for, for, for Papua and for the marginalized, for the oppressed. Uh, uh, for example, in 2018, uh, we published a, a specific report on unlawful killing and impunity in Papua. Uh, the report shows uh, since 2010 until 2018 uh, of 69 cases of unlawful killings uh, in Papua with 95 victims. Not a single case has been solved by the government. And this includes the bloody incidents in December 2014 in Pania district where security forces opened fire into Papuan protesters, including students, and killing four people and injured at least 11 others by bullets and by bayonets. The National Human Rights Commission has investigated the case, um, has officially categorized the Panyai case, for example, as, as a serious human rights violation in February last year. Komnesan submitted the results of investigation to the Attorney General Office in, in, in that month. However, the, the, the Attorney General Office uh, has rejected and returned the case files of Panyai case to Komnesan. They claim the, the formal and material requirements were deemed yet to be met. This is not for the first time. I think the Attorney General uh, has never brought the case of, the, of, of Wamena and Wasir to justice, despite Indonesian government's pledge before the UN Human Rights Council during the 2015 uh, Universal Periodical Review session in Geneva. But you know, we appreciate, we welcome the pledge, but we, we all know that it has never been uh, fulfilled. Uh, justice has never been delivered uh, for Papuan. And, and killings continue to take place in the region. Between 2018, for example, until 2021, 20, until this year, we recorded at least 59, 56 cases of suspected unlawful killings with 93 victims. So almost, you know, equal to 
the 10 years period of the of the of our previous uh, research and report and these alleged unlawful killings have typically taken place as result of unnecessary use of violence or excessive use of force during security operations. Military and police personnel often justify the killings of Papuan residents by claiming they were that they were members of the Free Papua Movement or they were members of armed criminal groups without any clear evidence. Uh, these are claims that are often denied by local residents and church leaders. And most perpetrators, again, have not been held to account for all the killings. One of the killing, or one of the most highlighted cases was the killing of reference Yeremia Zanambani, a 60 year old senior pastor in Intanjaya, who was allegedly shot and stabbed by an Indonesian soldier in September last year. So uh, today mark uh, the first anniversary of his death. Prior to his death, there was a shootout between pro-independent armed groups and the military, resulting in a soldier's death. Jeremy's killing reportedly happened amid the military's attempt to hand down members of the pro-independent groups. Again, National Human Rights Commission concluded that military members involved in the killing. Uh, even the joint fact-finding team uh, initiated by uh, the, the Menko Pol Hukam, the coordinating minister of politics, law, and security, Mahfoud, uh, concluded that the, uh, the, the, there is a strong indication that the military involved in the killing. However, up until now, we never seen the perpetrators being taken into court of law or into civilian court of law. So again, you know, we can name many other examples that show the weak rule of law uh, in, in Papua um, started from you know, the case of racist slurs in Surabaya that ended up with zero justice or the imprisonment of anti-racism -pro anti protesters uh, who were charged under the treason laws as well as the criminalizations of Veronica as a lawyer. So in conclusion, uh, I think it is clear that the Indonesian government's current uh, policy, current approach are not working at, and they must change uh, course uh, to avoid uh, further human rights violations and suffering of the Papuan people. Thanks, Tim. No, thank you, Uzman, um, yeah, for that very um, um, powerful explanation um, for us. But I, I guess um, just, just to one bit of housekeeping, we will continue 15 minutes for if the panelists are able to stay, that would be wonderful. Uh, and our translators, too, that would be excellent uh, for all those who can stay. We do appreciate it. I'm sorry we haven't got to too many of your questions, but just one more, um, Usman. Um, the, the, um, a lot of the talk in the chat is about the um, complicity of the international community. Uh, Australia, you know, as Richard's mentioned, um, was recently up the defence minister and the foreign minister meeting with their um, correspondent positions in, in Indonesia, and, and they forged a new agreement. Um, you know, what, what can the Australian public do about um, these situations? Because so many of the people joining the webinar today are from Australia and many of the calls in the chat are really about what, what can and what should Australia be doing? Well, I think there are many. Um, uh, among others are to speak with their, you know, with, with their governments, uh, with Australian government or with their senators and member parliament. Uh, to help uh, uh, the campaigns uh, to end human rights abuses in, in, in Papua. One of our suggestions is for uh, the Australian, uh, Australian public uh, to push or to, to call on Indonesian or Australian government to, you know, to speak with Indonesian government and to call for the Indonesian authorities to ensure that indigenous Papuans are given meaningful involvement in, 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 in every uh, Jakarta-driven uh, policy. And also to, to investigate, uh, to prosecute perpetrators responsible uh, behind the unlawful killings, which I highlighted uh, in, in, in my earlier remarks. And also uh, another suggestion perhaps uh, to, to make use of, 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 of bilateral talks between Indonesia and Australia uh, such as the one mentioned by uh, Professor Richard Chofel, I think to call for the Indonesian authorities to 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 you know to 
to immediately and to unconditionally release uh, prisoners of conscience such as Victor Yemo, um, not only in Papua, but also in, in Maluku, where we, we, we can find a peaceful uh, pro-independent uh, activists uh, are raising flags and uh, being arrested by the authorities and charged under the treason law. I think uh, 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 during, during bilateral talks or bilateral agreements between Indonesia and Australia, uh, Australian public can 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 try to you know to 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 call on Australian government to to make sure that every government every every single development aid development aid or uh, assistance in justice sectors in security sectors including uh, uh, the Lombok Pact in two thousand and six to to be uh, to be used as as a as a space for for calling on Indonesian. Uh, security actors to be held accountable, or <clears throat> to push Indonesian government to drop all the Makar, the charge, uh, the, the treason charges uh, brought against the peaceful political activists who who express their their political opinions peacefully, or to advocate for independence peacefully uh, uh, in Indonesia. Another another suggestion, perhaps, to to explore you know um, uh, possibilities for for. For Australia or international community to broker uh, to broker a peace accord between Jakarta and and pro Papuan independence, I think uh, indeed Papua is the most volatile area in which separatist movement remains highly active, and the desire to separate from Indonesian unitary state continues to be strong and even stronger uh, as Veronica mentioned about it. And, and of course, there are many reasons ranging from economic underdevelopment, lack of trust, and other political uh, disappointments to decades of, of human rights abuses. But I think, again, we have a very good precedence in Aceh where international community, key governments have helped uh, Indonesia or have helped uh, facilitating a peaceful uh, dialogue between uh, Jakarta and free Aceh movement. And Aceh wants home to Indonesia's most aggressive separatist campaign from 1950s to the early 2000s, 2000s and have, had witness, has witnessed a peace accord signed in 20, uh, 20, 2005, and it ended uh, much of the conflict and, and, and all types of violence in, in, in Aceh. Of Thanks course, so much. Uh, you know, Australian public can join our urgent action. Amnesty International Australia, Amnesty International Indonesia have started uh, uh, urgent action to, you know, to, to call on Indonesian government to release Victor Yemo and other prisoners of conscience and feel free uh, for any Australian to, to join uh, such urgent action. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Usman. I might just go to, to questions now. We've got a couple of quick ones. Um, there was one to you, Veronica, I think, mentioned that you were doing research, doing interviews with people that were suggesting that wouldn't be possible because of the internet blackout in Papua. Can you just give us a very brief explanation of how you did conduct those interviews? Uh, and I guess an, also that indication of what you think the international community should be doing to support uh, an improved human rights situation in Papua. Yeah, thank you. So I conduct an uh, interview um, by calling them directly because internet is often not working. And when it works, it's uh, pretty much bad uh, in Central Highlands. I, 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 uh, I call them directly. And then uh, because it's not easy to interview West Papuans because they might think, uh, who are you working for? Are you working? Are you spy? Uh, and uh, so uh, it's it's um, it's after how many years that I finally uh, gained their trust. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, and and some of the interviews I, I already heard about uh, child soldiers since when uh, before I was in uh, my self-imposed exile. So I, I I interviewed these people directly, tried to investigate about child soldiers before judging using Western perspectives. And um, and I still conduct uh, um, uh, uh, frequent interview um, and 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 this uh, uh, and and West Papuans who are in the uh, uh, conflict. I mean, just like like fresh shootings, for example, they uh, they 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 go. They usually go to another to neighboring towns to get the signal, and then they will try to to uh, to to inform other people about what happened. So that's how. 
and that's also why when there's a big incident in West Papua, we have to wait several days um, uh, so that, that the witnesses already reach towns when they're, they're signaled and, and to safety. Uh, while if we just uh, we just consume what what we heard in the incident that day, it means you are hearing the Indonesian forces version, and that's always uh, different to the West Papua's uh, version. And uh, about what international community can do is, uh, I think particularly in in Australia, the Australians must. Uh, I think it's time to rip off Lombok Treaty because they say this this problematic clause about that. That I think that's why the uh, the Australian government is so reluctant to speak about West Papua, as if because it it might violate this uh, uh, treaty that's uh, about um, Australia is respecting the sovereignty of uh, Indonesia, we are, we are speaking about human rights here. It's, it's uh, uh, way above uh, the, the doctrine of uh, territorial integrity, human rights, and even self-even self-determination. It has higher hierarchy under international law. It's above just uh, up the doctrine of territorial integrity. And uh, I think that's what, uh, I think that's a major problem in, in, in Australia. And, and it's a shame that uh, I'll, uh, according to based on the Guardian investigation published, I think last month, that a, 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 a Indonesian police officer, an Australian trained uh, Indonesian police uh, officer, uh, did torture in Aceh and also uh, a torture in West Papua, resulting in one death of a West Papuan uh, peaceful activist. And and yet. A few weeks after that, that investigation report, Australia announced that uh, uh, it will, uh, what is increasing uh, uh, cooperation with Indonesian forces, so similar training and then more, more, more forces are, are, will be trained in Australia. I think this is also a chance for Australian public to, to get more um, accountability from Australian government. It means Australian government is now directly have direct, imp uh, 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 I mean, implication in uh, human rights abuses in West Papua because they are giving more support to human rights abusers. And um, yeah, uh, that's my opinion. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much, Veronica. Um, Rosa, I just want to come to you. A suggestion was made in the chat, I think, by Jakob that um, Victor Yemma was was receiving good uh, healthcare in hospital. Um, that wasn't what I heard you say. Um, interested in your your response to that, but also what you think the the Australian public should be doing about the situation. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, the latest uh, condition of Victor Yemo is he's in the hospital at the moment, and I think uh, the best or the best um, things that we need is to to actually release him because. Uh, what he did is actually just uh, he's, he's spoken uh, on the, the demonstration on the 19th of uh, uh, August in 2019 about the racism. And I think uh, the issue of racism is a universal issue and it's a human rights issue. And he's, there's nothing to do with against the state. So I think he should be released along with uh, many of our political prisoners because uh, West Papuan political prisoners they they speak about the the real situation and what uh, West Papuans demands for their self determination, and as Veronica said, uh, self determination is a right, uh, human rights, and and I think it should be uh, fulfilled. And the release of Victoriamo and many uh, political prisoners will be one of the uh, kind of evidence that Indonesia as a state really uh, care and and want to improve the human rights situation in Indonesia. Uh, I also actually want to raise a bit, uh, because every speaker has already talked about uh, many perspectives from historical background, political background, uh, you know. But as a West Papuan, I think the most important thing is um, our voices need to be heard by anybody, by any institution, any state. I think it's very important that uh, West Papuan being uh, oppressed for many years just to speak about their rights 
And I think uh, we can do a lot of analysis from different perspectives, but the voice of West Papuan is very important. And opening a space like this for West Papuan to speak up is very important. And I think Amnesty International doing this uh, webinar is very important. We need more West Papuan to speak up and especially to bring uh, the political and also situation and perspective from West Papua to the table so it can be um, uh, followed by uh, international community because we know that uh, access for the journalists to come and visit West Papua is very limited especially with the COVID situation we can't get uh, media from outside to come and we need a uh, space to speak up and West Papuan, they can speak up, but it's, there is just no space on that. Um, and also, I think in terms, people talk about armed conflict, people talk about IDPs, and that's all human rights abuses happening because of their roots problem, which is a political problem that never be, been solved. Because Indonesia is just too afraid to put that issue on the table and speak and talk, negotiate equally with the West Papuan. Mm -hmm. I think you know australia new zealand you have done a lot of good things with other other neighbors for example bougainville the process of conflict in bougainville was uh you know really supported by australia and new zealand especially new zealand take over the position of mediating process and i think if Aust if new zealand or australia can do this i think this is this is something that we can appreciate and not rather than talking about security and defense and uh, people's West Papua uh, life is, is very important. It's a matter for human rights, you know. We can't you know, create the defense and security without, uh, and especially with the Lombok Treaty, it's very uh, kind of concern for us. It's limiting a space for people to talk about West Papua and the issue of humanity in West Papua. So I think some I, I read some question about uh, how to create a peaceful in West Papua. Peace situation, peaceful situation only can be resolved if we are willingness to, uh, there is a willingness from the Indonesia as a state to uh, talk about human rights, to be honest with their human rights violations that are happening, to stop the military operation, to stop the killing of the ordinary people, and use that conflict, political conflict as an excuse to send more troops like what happened in Intan Jaya, in Duga, and, and we all know that this all motivation is not to protect people, but actually to secure the investment area because they're targeting Wabu block for the gold, the next gold mining. And also in those areas, it's all related to the mining interest. And we all know that while he just uh, published a report about that and we knew that, and all this infrastructure project and development uh, project that uh, um, planned and you know uh, run by the Indonesian government it's all investment oriented it's not for the development it's not to develop people's life especially for the West Papuan's life on benefit but it's more on the way to open the interest and access for the investment and a big investment to come and digging the natural resources from the ground in West Papua and killing so many civilians people uh, of West Papua. And when we talk about conflict in Kiwirok, we can't just pointing directly to the actors because we need more analysis on that. Who's behind all of this incident? You can follow, started from Duga in 2018, started in Intanjaya, and then in Tambrau, and then in uh, Maibrat, and now in Kiwirok. What is that? Is it only about the uh, armed uh, struggle group that fighting against the Indonesian military and killing civilians? No. You have to stay and look at the perspective of West Papuan as well. Because I think the armed groups also know that they don't want to kill the civilians. As Veronica's question before, that there are a lot of evidence in the ground that not publicly uh, appears on the media mainstream because there is no access to that. So I think we need to develop that perspective, not only looking at that, uh, the state perspective, but also try to look at the, the perspective of West Papua. And we've been killed, we've been uh, experienced all this racism, discrimination since the beginning of the integration in, uh, to Indonesia in 1960. And I think that experience is already enough 
it's already accumulated in many of West Papuan life. Each person has their personal experience, individual experience of being oppressed, and it becomes accumulation of the uh, of the uh, common. Uh, what we call memoria passionis. We have all these memories since, our, since we were born until now. We still experience the same thing. So the only way to stop all of, is, all of this is to allow West Papua to speak equally with Indonesia. And, and we need support from the international uh, community. And I think with the good relationship between Australian government and Indonesia or New Zealand government and Indonesia, I think you should play your role you know you want to be a, a look at a good guy in this region put that issue on the table and allow west papuan to speak with indonesia equally and then we can find a solution we can discuss about solution what is the best solution for that so stop the human right abuses stop sending military and uh, police troops join operation in any form uh, including nemangkawi uh, special task force which is targeting activists uh, and also the labeling of the West Papuan uh, freedom movement uh, activists as a terrorist. I think that's very, very uh, discriminating. If, you, if people or if a state, uh, if the Indonesian government said that they are respect on human rights, no oppression, military oppression anymore, please uh, prove that. Prove it. Not only put it on the statement, but prove it that you are not doing any harassment and abuse to your own citizen, which is West Papuan. Because if you're still doing this, um, you can you you can accept you have to accept that West Papuan still uh, speak up about their right to freedom, right for independence and self determination. Because there is no hope when we we look at the reality on the ground in West Papua. There is no hope for West Papua to trust uh, Indonesia as our, our part of us because every time they keep sending troops, police to kill people, even the inter, uh, internal displaced people being ignored. There is, there is no uh, approach, even the Palang Merah Indonesia is not going there to look at the victims of this uh, uh, conflict. So to whom we should cry for, because the only way to do it is to fight against that violence. The only way to do it is to fight uh, against this injustice. And people like, like Victor Yemo and many of the activists, uh, they, they walk to the street and they speak up because our voice being blocked and not being heard. So this is the moment that I want to call for your solidarity Anything you can do to stop any human rights violations that happen in West Papua, please do in your capacity. Either you are journalists, you are activists, you are parliament members, human rights officer, or whatever your position is, please do. Because we talk about human life. We are not talking about the territory of the Thank you. No, Rosa, thank you uh, very much. I'm sorry to conclude this um, conversation, but that's a very um, powerful way, I think, to end it. We, it has been a, a fascinating and illuminating conversation today. Um, I do want to thank um, the translators for the wonderful work they have done. Give yourselves a pat on the back. Um, and uh, I also particularly want to thank the team at uh, AI Indonesia, particularly Narina and Afra Novell, who've, who've helped pull this uh, webinar together over the last few weeks. My colleagues at uh, Amnesty Australia, uh, particularly Dan, who's um, taken on the tech duties today, and also Rose for initiating the conversation, Lucy and Joel also for their support. Um, I particularly want to thank the, the speakers um, for providing such uh, incredible insights. I mean, it's a very interesting thread that has run through the conversation throughout the day. Um, those human rights abuses occurring on the ground um, and the trust that is lost from that and how that becomes a cycle uh, and how uh, I think Richard talked about that being the, the um, you know, human rights violations being a problem of governance for the, um, the Indonesian government, particularly. Um, Veronica talked powerfully about the impacts of um, um, conflict and the displacement of 50,000 people now who are um, removed from their homes in um, West Papua. 
and Usman, of course, with his very articulate uh, summation of, of, of the very complex issue. If you are interested in more of these um, conversations, do please get in touch, fill out the evaluation form, let us know. We are committed to, to raising the voice of um, people like Rosa, um, who have so much to say. Uh, I do again encourage you to take action for Victor. Uh, there are many other prisoners of conscience in Papua that we also continue to fight for. Um, and also ultimately thank you very much uh, for participating today, for coming along. I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to go to all your questions, uh, but I hope you enjoyed the conversation. It will be recorded and we will um, send you a version uh, in, in uh, the, next com the next couple of days. Uh, and again, thank you and um, farewell. Okay, many thank thanks, you. Tim. Thank you. Thank you, Amnesty. Thank you. Thank you, Pa Richard. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Pa Usman, Veronica, Pa Richard. Thank you, Karina, Daniel. Thank you all. Thank you.